Hi, and welcome to WCET's first webcast in our OER series, Strategies and Tools for Finding, Adopting, and Managing OER. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Manager of Programs and Events here at WCET. We're very excited to have so many of you with us here today, and we are recording this webcast. We'll make it available on our website, and we will also send you an email notice when the archive is available, and we encourage you to share that with your colleagues. As we go along, if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them into the question box, and we have several presentations and a lot of content to get through, so we're going to hold all of the questions till the end of the presentation. If by chance we can't get to all of your questions today, I'll be sure to pull out those questions and share them with our panelists and we'll provide written responses back to you. If you'd like to access the PowerPoint presentation for today's presentation, you should be able to download it from the handout panel toward the bottom portion of the GoToWebinar pane. We typically have a pretty active Twitter back channel. Be sure to follow at hashtag WCET webcast. Again, if you have questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box. You'll also see that we have a chat box. If you have anything to share, feel free to post that either to a presenter, an organizer, or a specific uh, panelist. And I, if there's anything that I want to make sure gets out to the rest of the group, I can repost that on your behalf. Today we have a busy agenda, as I explained earlier. We'll talk about what exactly OER is and why it matters cover some historic OER efforts, where we're at with OER efforts across states and systems in the United States. We'll go into a specific user experience from Thomas Edison State University, and then Intellis will share their approach with us. Today's moderator is Tanya Spilavoy, who is a WCET steering committee member, and she's also the director of distance education and state authorization at North Dakota University System, which includes 11 institutions. So I'd like to go ahead and pass it over to Tanya. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Tanya Spillavoy, and I'm speaking with you from Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, I have a unique position that I'm in charge of uh, state authorization for the state. So all of you who seek authorization to North Dakota um, would be contacting me. I'm also the SARA portal agent uh, for North Dakota and part of the WCET steering committee as well as the MEC SARA committee. Um, I'm currently leading uh, an initiative in North Dakota for open educational resources. It's been a really exciting um, collaboration with the legislature and the 11 institutions in North Dakota. We've gotten a lot of traction and I think probably in the next few months I'll be able to come back and tell you some of the exciting things that we're doing here. Um, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what state authorization, I mean, sorry, what open educational resources are. And I just want to start with um, the first slide. Megan, can you help me advance, please? I'm not sure why my controls aren't working. Okay, so we take the um, Hewlett Foundation definition for open educational resources, and the reason why we do that is because in 2002, Hewlett Foundation was really the established foundation that made open educational resources part of their strategic plan. So I'm going to point out some really important parts of the definition so that we all have a really clear understanding of what that is. It's the teaching, learning, and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. Open educational resources includes full courses, course materials, modules, textbooks, streaming videos, tests, software, and any other tools, materials, or techniques used to support access to knowledge. So this definition of open educational resources is very a very broad umbrella that encompasses a lot of different learning objects and a lot of different tools that we would use um, to teach our students. 
The main characteristic of an open educational resource is that it's open. So really focus on the word open. And the two main things that you need to take away are that it's free, so there should be no cost, and that the rights are that you can access it. So there's other characteristics. Um, whenever they're in the public domain or they've gotten a free or a, a Creative Commons license, that means um, folks can use the resource, you can keep it, you can reuse it, you can change it, so that means you can revise it to something that fits your needs, maybe for your classroom. Um, sometimes uh, things need to be updated within the open educational resource. Let's say you're doing, uh, you download a, a lecture from someone or um, and the dates are wrong, you can always change those. You could remix it, which means you could use pieces of the resource, and you can also redistribute it. The main characteristic is that you cannot charge people then to use those resources. So part of the open concept is that um, if you get it for free and use it, then you also offer it to others for free. So you might see this. Uh, this is a Creative Commons license. There are a number of different Creative Commons licenses and people use them in um, different combinations. So you can actually go to the Creative Commons website. I won't explain it all in full detail today, but um, you can take a look at it and we'll probably discuss it further in other webinars or um, blog posts about um, openly licensed public domain materials. But basically, Creative Commons licenses take the place of what we would consider a traditional copyright. A traditional copyright would say, uh, this piece of intellectual property belongs to the author. You cannot use it unless you get permission from the author. You cannot remix it. You can't, um, you know, really you can't do much with something that's been copyrighted. Creative Commons licenses give you a lot more liberty to um, use, share, remix, redistribute um, things that people have created. So this is my reason that I love to share. Uh, the, whole, the whole concept of open really is sort of a grassroots and really a, a unified movement toward making education open and free and accessible to future generations. So the girl on the left in this photo um, holding this, the hockey stick, that's my daughter Ruby. She's six and those are her little friends. They're out skating. I'm just imagining a world where kids, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, what country they were born in, what neighborhood they happen to live in, have access to information um, without having to go through a whole bunch of um, passwords and um, pay to get information. Um, even a lot of the uh, research that we produce as intellectuals and as um, researchers is behind a whole bunch of um, permissions. So I'll give you an example. Um, I graduated from my doctoral program in 2013 and I absolutely loved the databases at my university. Uh, I couldn't wait to get in there and um, and learn more. But as soon as my program was over, I was no longer given permission to access databases um, at my university. So all of those resources were taken away from me. Um, there's a lot of push now to make more intellectual um, information available to people regardless of um, where they are in the world, whether it's um, Cambodia or Africa or right down the street in Bismarck, North Dakota. So why does this matter for higher education? This matters because textbook costs are out of control. We know that um, publishers make a lot of money off of the textbooks. Uh, some of the estimates are $1,100 a year, $1,100 per student per year. Um, some students pay more, some students pay less. This is actually my best friend. Her name is Kim, and she gave me permission to use this, but she posted it on Facebook. Um, when Kim was uh, about 20 years old, we were high school 
I mean, college roommates, and she got pregnant and had to drop out of college. And now she's not um, a college-age student anymore. She's a, a non-traditional, you know, 30-something person. And she's trying to go back as a single mother and do school again, get her degree. So textbooks for Kim are really oppressive. $500 for five books is really difficult for her to pay for. She's um, supporting two boys and she works at a daycare. When I saw this post on Facebook, I, it made my work with open educational resources even more valuable and um, resonated with me a lot more about how important this is to make um, education more affordable for students. So a lot of people say, where can I find open educational resources? And Babson survey did do a, a, pretty, a really great survey asking um, professors what their barriers to success were. And I think the Intellis people will talk more about that later. I also conducted a statewide um, uh, survey of all the instructors and professors here in North Dakota. And my results were the same. It's very difficult for folks to know where to find open resources, sometimes they'll do a Google search and they have a difficult time, you know, vetting what is quality. Uh, here's some great places to start. Uh, if I were you, I would start with the, open, the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Library. It is a phenomenal resource. Um, it has been funded by the Hewlett Foundation. They do a great job collecting all of the open textbooks that are being produced right now. Um, you can go to Rice OpenStax. You can also talk to your own library, so a lot of librarians know about open resources. They understand the copyright licenses and the Creative Commons licenses. Some of the biggest movers in the movement of open are right in your library, so people probably don't even know that. Um, instructional designers on your campus are fantastic at helping you adopt the resources and integrate them into your classrooms, whether it be uh, an LMS platform or something that you use right in your classroom. I would, if you have any instructional designers on your campus, please utilize them. Um, there's also TEDx Talks are openly licensed. Uh, you can't um, use pieces of a TEDx talk. You can't just use parts of it. You have to use the whole. So it's important to look at what exactly the Creative Commons license is on each of these pieces of OER. Um, you can also go to Khan Academy and some YouTube videos. So basically, any openly licensed learning object, licensed learning object is free to use. And um, I would just start at maybe Merlot and um, Open Textbook Library. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, our next group of in, uh, presenters. <laughs> Um, Mark Treese is the president of Intellis Learning with 25 years in ed tech. Mark's career is focused on the intersection of education and technology spanning from content and learning to enrollment management and beyond. Um, Matt Cooper is the associate provost for the Center for Learning and Technology at Thomas Edison State University. Uh, the CLT is responsible for course development, instructional design, assessment development, content adoption, and academic technologies for the university. Uh, Natalie Murray is the learning design and product lead at Intellis Learning, and Natalie is seasoned instructional designer and curriculum consultant who is driven, driving the Intellis product capabilities to bring life to course design and student experience. I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Tanya. Thank you both for a wonderful introduction to OER in our session today and also for the terrific work that you're doing. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Um, I'm incredibly excited to join you and to discuss what I believe is probably, if not the most, certainly one of the top uh, important topics in uh, higher education today. And I'm working here to try to get the slide deck to move forward. There we go. 
not sure if I have uh, Megan mouse control or, or the presentation at this point, but I will roll with it. Um, you know, what you see here on the slide is, is a lot of uh, wonderful individuals and groups and organizations who have been doing work in OER. And, you know, I remember hearing about OER even back a dozen years ago. Um, and there has been tremendous progress to date. And it's brought us to a point where um, someone could advance to the next slide, please. So it's brought us to a point today um, where we're seeing uh, really impressive work with OER across the country. We're seeing work by uh, legislators and systems of higher ed and individual campuses, and this is all very exciting. Uh, this is a really encouraging uh, set of activities that we've seen in, in the recent year or two. Um, but there are, of course, still challenges to overcome. And there's a tremendous amount written. For those of you who attend a lot of the same conferences I do, you hear about the challenges as well as the, the progress that's being made. This EDUCAUSE report on the success of OER in the first 10 years um, does a nice job of summarizing the, the hurdles, if you will. And they really center around three core hurdles. One thing they talk about is as folks try to take OER and to use it in practical ways, there's a challenge around one, discoverability. You know, simply where do I go to find the content I'm looking for? The second challenge they identify is evaluation and quality control. So as I'm looking for content, how do I evaluate? How do I find content that aligns to my course topics um, as well as my course outcomes and learning objectives? And is this of sufficient quality? And the third thing that they talk about is the last mile problem you know, basically how to make it easy for individuals. There's also uh, work, uh, the second reference here is Washington State Board of Technical and Community Colleges. And even one of the most aggressive and supportive systems in the country recognizes the limitations in their award-winning report uh, that I reference here that's based upon interviews with and surveys with nearly 800 faculty. And the report details that faculty really want to make education accessible for their students. And, and as Tanya was referencing as, as well, this report cites the cost of going to college as a serious barrier. And they believe increasing the use of no cost or low cost content can play a big role in helping students stay in school. And we hear a lot about this as we travel around the country. Now, the report points out that as they look to accomplish this, they also see challenges, and they're very similar to the EDUCAUSE report. They talk about the significant time it takes to wade through information. In other words, you know, this, this process of trying to identify the, the OER information is cumbersome. Secondly, they talk about the lack of easy to use and appropriate technology to support the effort to use OER, and thirdly, the uncertainty about the content itself. Um, and, and this pertains to digital content broadly, but, but specifically OER. And then the last report I mentioned here is the Babson survey. And if we can go to the next screen, please, um, of more than 2,000 institutions. And I uh, reference these two sentences because I think they, they grab a key concept. They talk about while awareness of OER remains low among teaching faculty, it is not the critical barrier to wider adoption. Rather, the time and effort required to find, evaluate, and adopt these materials is the critical factor. So this is um, a, a pretty common theme that we're seeing. Again, it's, it's a lot to be excited about, but we're still seeing some of these key barriers. So I wanted to pause here for a moment and put out a poll question, actually two poll questions to the group on the phone. Um, and Megan, if you could help me with that. The first question we're asking is, what are the challenges in using OER for a course and across your institution? And if you could please um, uh, put in your submission to the poll, we'd appreciate it. And I believe right after that, we can show the results. So I'll give you a minute to do that. OK, 
Okay, I, I'll go ahead and push the results and we can move on to the next one. So while that's loading, I'll introduce the second poll question. The second poll question is, what impact do you expect open education resources to have on, what, sorry, there's the results there. Okay, so interesting. So it looks like the top is the time required for course revision and redesign. Um, that's a, a very common one that, that we hear about. Um, looks like quality of OER um, content, a, a big concern we hear. Um, and awareness and access uh, certainly are um, large factors as well. So it seems like pretty, pretty good, um, consistent um, uh, reaction or, or, or sort of sense of things from this group as well. So Megan, can we bring up the, the second poll question? And this one deals with the impact that you expect OER to have on your institution, and I'll give you a few minutes there to respond to that. Okay, so it looks like um, improved student access to resources and to supplement paid content with free content, uh, as well as replacement of paid content for free content are the, the top choices. Um, so again, I think very consistent with the aspirations we see broadly um, across the, the marketplace and really important goals, you know, reflecting back to Tanya's uh, opening comments that I think are spot on with the sort of desire and need that we see in, in higher ed today. So thank you for participating in the two polls. So going back then to um, our discussion, um, what we tend to see both reflected in your poll responses as well as um, you know, broadly in the market, we tend to see the, the sort of answers to these things clustered in three key areas that sort of affect how folks think about adopting OER um, and what they aspire to have as part of their OER adoption. The first being efficiency, um, again, mirrored uh, strongly in your poll results. You know, effectively, how do I discover and curate OER content for my course? This needs to be efficient, it needs to be easy, it needs to be intuitive. The second is um, we hear a lot around affordability, as it should be, as a core driver. So how does OER affect affordability for my course, uh, for my institution, and for my students? And then the other common cluster that of, of responses that we tend to hear is um, around quality. And this was mirrored again in your poll results as a top consideration. I think it was 60 or 61 percent, which is, you know, essentially um, I'm looking to adopt OER content, but I want to make sure that it's quality content and it doesn't negatively affect the student experience and student success, persistence, and, and so forth. So those, those are the three common themes that we tend to see. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the other concept I wanted to introduce is, is sort of this affordability um, use case. And when it comes to how institutions want to use OER, we, we tend to hear a wide variety of potential use cases. Now, use case number one is pretty straightforward. And this is, I think, as folks think about things, typically what they first think about, which is, you know, a faculty member who wants to replace commercial content, maybe a commercial textbook, um, with uh, OER content. Um, that's typically the first use case that people think about is, 
the textbook is it goes away and in an OER textbook or OER content takes its place. Now you can see under the future case, I put in brackets for each of these and potentially commercial and a little bit of a curveball, but I want to take a minute to explain this. What we find is there's a tremendous amount of high quality commercial content that is already subscribed to by your institution. So perhaps it's your library who has subscribed to content that's high quality and of instructional uh, quality as well. Um, or perhaps repositories of publisher content your institution has already subscribed to, in addition to your own internal repositories of content that your uh, faculty have created. So, you know, I'll limit the discussion of OER, but one of the things we hear a lot about um, is this notion of it's, it's a no-cost, but also a low-cost model. And if there is, is quality commercial content that's affordable or free to me, um, we want to be thinking about using that content as well to decrease the, the um, cost and drive affordability. Okay, so I'll focus on OER because that is the target here. So that's use case one. Use case two is where faculty may want to augment their existing content with OER. Um, and uh, this would be, you know, for example, where you want to add uh, additional content to existing content in certain topic areas. Number three is related, but this is where you may want to supplement um, content. So faculty may see gaps in their current content where particular topics or subtopics are not um, covered by the content that's being used today, and we can supplement that with OER content is, is the use case. The next three relate to where perhaps a faculty member is using OER today. Um, so number four is, again, that augment scenario where faculty may be using OER and they want to augment that with some additional OER content. Number five, this is an interesting one. Um, this is where faculty may have started to use, for example, an OER textbook. So maybe they went from a commercial textbook to an OER textbook. But as they look at their topics and subtopics and course outcomes and learning objectives, they see that there are gaps. And they want to identify um, pieces of OER content that can fill those gaps. And number six may be a little bit further out in time, but something we hear about. And this is an instance where faculty may have been using OER content for some time. And that they find that the quality or effectiveness of that content is not where they would like it to be. So they want to replace either portions of the OER content with new OER content, or perhaps all of it. So I wanted to cover that to give a sense that there are multiple use cases, um, all of which I think um, have a terrific opportunity to benefit from uh, OER use. Can you move to the next slide, please? So Intellis Learning recently put together a cohort of seven institutions uh, and actually about uh, close to 70 faculty members that represent a very broad cross-section of institutions. It's sort of like Noah's Ark. There's, you know, roughly two of each, each type. And, and this is very purposeful. Um, thinking about those use cases we talked about a bit, uh, the use cases are spread across all the different scenarios we discussed a minute ago. Some of these institutions do centralized course development with heavy instructional design focus. Uh, others are decentralized, where it's decentralized to the faculty. Some have significant online programs where others are more classroom-based. Some are focused on developing new courses, and others are primarily focused on revising existing courses. So we, we see all different scenarios. And I think uh, the wonderful thing about it is that the thing that's in common is across all a common desire to efficiently discover, curate, and deploy quality OER content where they can track the effectiveness of it to drive affordability and drive student success. And that's a wonderful unifying aspect. Now, we're fortunate to have um, on our webinar this afternoon, um, Matt Cooper from Thomas Edison State University, one of these institutions here, and I'd like to turn things over to Matt.
Okay, so our first our first motivator is really the self-evident one, to keep costs low. This is something we all have in common. Uh, essentially, we wanted to keep our student costs low for taking courses, but we also wanted to keep our development costs for creating online courses as low as possible. Another one of our big motivators was really that we wanted to stop designing our online courses towards a textbook. Well, we really wanted to embrace a learning outcomes first approach toward instructional design. And by that I mean we wanted to stop utilizing the textbook structure basically as a skeleton outline that controlled just how we would create an online course as it tends to stifle creativity in our pedagogical approach. We also wanted to supplement existing paid course content. Mark hit on this a little bit already too. Some of the paid resources we had work very well for us and we want to keep them, but they don't always cover every element of a course in the best possible way. So we're looking for a way to utilize open education resources in this capacity. Uh, and perhaps most importantly for us from a logistical perspective, uh, we wanted to gain more control over this perpetual revision cycle of textbook edition updates. Uh, this is something I'm sure we all have in common to a certain degree. So for us, this led to a series of pilots regarding open education resources over the past six or seven years, and we had varying degrees of success with, with uh, each. Oops. Oh. Sorry, I think we skipped the slide. There we go. So theoretically, uh, we're really well positioned and maybe even better than most to adopt open education resources into our courses. Uh, and we offer over 700 online courses. Uh, we have a centralized course design process within the university. Uh, we have teams that are in charge of curriculum design, assessment development, academic technology, video creation, learning outcomes assessment, and instructional services, all under one roof within the CLT, Center for Learning and Technology. Uh, we've effectively disaggregated the course development process into specialized teams for each of these functions within the CLT as part of our process. So we have a team of instructional designers uh, who are effectively our project managers and our curriculum experts. Uh, we also have a team of assessment development specialists, and these are individuals who really understand psychometrics and the principles behind creating valid and sustainable test banks and items. We have an instructional technology team to handle the learning management system, which we use Moodle, and academic technology vendors and services that we want to incorporate into our courses. Uh, we also recently introduced a media creation studio team, which helps us create customized video and even simulations for some of our courses. And we have an instructional services team that I mentioned, this with the implementation of all these course designs that the team creates. And we have about 12 semesters a year, so it's a pretty aggressive schedule for how we handle things and how we handle projects. Uh, and we've even evolved to embrace specialized individual roles. Uh, we have a learning outcome specialist as part of our team. Uh, we have an assistant director of course sustainability, which is really a fancy way of saying managing a revision process for our textbooks and our courses. And we eventually even added a library resources specialist based on some of our findings in these OER pilots that we went through. And finally, we have our mentors. And our mentors are our subject matter expert consultants. Uh, the nice thing about their, the format in which we use, use them and utilize them is that we have the flexibility to include one, two, or an entire team of SMEs on any particular course project, which gives us multiple eyes on, us, on the same course. The other reason that we're well positioned for success is that we have a centralized quality control and standards that are created and enforced by the entire academic affairs division at the university. So we work in coordination with the provost and the deans of each school to establish their parameters for successful course design and rigor within all of our courses. So the result of all this is that we really don't have that many roadblocks for open education resource implementation. Uh, we have the ability to influence hundreds of courses very quickly and efficiently. Uh, our numbers kind of speak to that a little bit. Uh, in our current format, we design around 60 new courses every year and revising in some capacity between 300 and 400 existing courses every year, which basically means we're touching each of our courses once every two years in a very substantive way. So you think this would lay the framework for a nice model for success with adopting OER at scale, and that really fueled our excitement for it. So we were really interested in adopting it at scale the university. We've had a lot of attempts at this, and some of these involved commercial partners, some of them are entirely in-house efforts using the staff and resources that we have at our disposal. And some of our pilots were through nonprofit organizations that help partner with us. But the main theme amongst all those pilots is that we really wanted to replace commercial textbooks entirely, if at all possible. And as I've already mentioned, we've had some mixed results with this. But we have learned quite a bit. 
Uh, on the positive side, it really confirmed the value of open educational resources for our students in our institution. Uh, students and mentors both expressed love for it. Uh, students enjoyed it. They didn't feel like there was any gaps in their uh, courses. They felt like their experience was fulfilling. Mentors enjoyed facilitating these courses. And we really had the survey data and course evaluation data to back that up. Now, from an instructional design perspective, the final product was excellent. We had tight back maps in our courses, strong assessment components in these. And some of these courses are some of our um, more marquee courses that we've created in our existence recently. Now, as I've already alluded to, we've had some challenges and some struggles with these pilots, and many of these will sound familiar as well. One of our biggest challenges it revolves around missing assessment components. So even though we have an assessment development team, uh, any assessment developer will tell you that creating an objective test bank is easier working from a poor test bank, which might be the case of the particular textbook, rather than building it all from scratch, which is a function of time. So we can do these things, but they take quite a bit of time as the poll results really indicated. Uh, we also had difficulty in targeting, targeting specific levels of learning when investigating open education resources. So to give an example of this, um, there are plenty of accounting resources out there, hundreds if not thousands of resources, but our issue was if we wanted to create an accounting 200 level course with a specific set of course objectives, how do we find the right resource and how do we get that in the course and how are we able to identify it appropriately. And both, both of these problems really required significant investment of time uh, from our, our staff. So our time to create these courses drastically increased. Um, our usual format is that we have between you know, 12 weeks or so of project time for each of our courses. Our time to create these courses ended up scaling by two times or three times longer to develop one course, which with our fast-paced environment wasn't exactly an optimal solution for us. The other issue we found was that the course material choices, even though they're being made by a group of people, this design team that we have, along with the subject matter experts and the mentors, if someone or if the team isn't aware of a specific opportunity in an OER resource that might exist, who's going to bring that to the table? And that's a skill set that we realized is, uh, is a little more unique. It's not something that every instructional designer has. Um, it's something that uh, is more to it than just what meets the eye. Uh, finally, the other nice thing you get from paid resources is the multimedia and the extras. We found ourselves developing more of that in-house, which again is a function of time. And finally, we could find materials for a lot of courses, especially a lot of our general education courses and our mainline undergraduate courses, but we do have a lot of niche courses that were a little more difficult to find specific resources for. Let's see. So in general, our, our, through all of these pilots, it's not just one, it's been multiple, we went into these thinking that we would be a great success at adopting these, but we found that it was nearly impossible for us to adopt these resources at scale and still maintain the same levels of quality, the standards of quality that we had established without increasing our development timeline substantially. So really two things came out of our pilots. One solution was that we would need to basically add a team of research librarians or people with those skills who specialize in open education resources to help us aggregate and index these resources efficiently, uh, which is a, a very costly endeavor. Or two, we could find a partner who could fill this role for us and work with our teams. And that's effectively how we came across Intellis. They approached us with the idea of this cohort and we were very excited about it for two big reasons. Uh, one is their discovery services, as I've already mentioned. Uh, we would essentially provide them with our course objectives and our learning objectives, our outcomes, and they would give us open education resource recommendations based on our specific needs, and they would have someone there curating this platform to help us find what we need to find. Uh, and secondly, the thing we're very excited to see more of is the value of the analytics data they're talking about with this platform. We really want to know that our students are using these resources effectively, and we want to measure how effective they really are on the courses. Uh, so we'd like to know things like how long, how much time are students spending with these resources, or how effective are they when helping students achieve their learning goals. And I believe Natalie will be elaborating on some of this next in the presentation. So we're really hopeful that a unique solution like Intellis will help us adopt OER at scale in a way that works with our course design model. Now the cohort has just begun for us, but we're really eager to see how their services might be able to help us scale our open education resource efforts. So with that said, I'm going to turn this over to Natalie so she can talk more about the platform itself.
Natalie, I believe you are on mute, but we should be able to hear you now if you want to go ahead and start. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. And let me, let's see, Megan, it looks like you're setting up the PowerPoint for me. Thank there you me. very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Matt and everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, as we continue the presentation, I'll lead us through um, a few points of, you know, the challenges that we've all um, you know, identified and are facing with OER as well as some of the ways that we're very successful with using OER as, as Matt um, described. So specifically, I'll be going through what the cohort institutions are experiencing and um, some of the workflow as well as some of the data that we've collected. So as we are working with our cohort group of institutions, we've surveyed over 70 participants on a variety of topics from what is happening in their courses today to how OER is used and then the use of data. I'll touch on a few of these data points because I think it's relevant um, in our overall discussion. So on the topic of uh, selecting content um, for a course, uh, beyond the topical alignment and accuracy, the things that we're seeing come out is um, really important is just the ease of use of content for faculty to discover um, as well as for students to use, the accessibility component and then the production quality. So all these things are, are major drivers for actually selecting the content and then thinking about um, the time it takes. Um, as we all, uh, through, our, through our poll during this webinar, as well as through other data points, we're finding that the major challenge is around time that it takes to find content. You pair that with um, faculty workload, and um, as Matt mentioned and others have represented through their data and their experiencing experiences, the instructional designers workload or even the librarians are helping out, um, that the time is major, a major contributor um, in both the, the discovery as well as the review and selection. And then focusing on the student, um, what we found from um, our institutions that we're working with is that um, there's a $100 to $200 per course range on course materials and that 50% of students aren't purchasing the resources. So this means that students don't have the um, resources that they need on um, the first day of class or maybe throughout the entire class. And then considering how uh, faculty or mentors are um, using data um, or even instructional advisors are using data today um, to support students. And what we're hearing is that the majority of that data comes from um, student assessment. So if students didn't perform well or if they asked a question during class or even their course surveys. Um, and that data is really used for uh, student interventions and then to add content to the course while the course is going on. But there's not a real understanding about what students are engaging with um, and what resources are highly valuable to them. Megan, if you can progress for me. Oops, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, great. So to address these challenges that faculty and IDs face, as well as respond to the great opportunity of OER, um, as we said, the Intel's team as well as our cohort institutions are focused on kind of five components of the ecosystem. And the approach that I'm outlining here are what the, uh, the cohort institutions are actually going through. And so first is, um, you know, setting up a review library, a, a digital index of um, content across many OER repositories. So instead of going to each one of those individual very, um, very great resources, repository resources, um, having it all in one unified experience um, for discovery. And then in order to discover content, as Matt mentioned, it, it needs to be organized in, in a way that is relevant to that institution based on their core, you know, key course topics, the course outcomes, and learning objectives. Um, so instead of entering in specific search terms or having to come up with what those concepts should be, you know, organizing the content in a way that is well-structured for, um, for courses. And then during the curation process, just being able to efficiently review content, um, evaluate its usefulness, and then adopt it and publish it within the LMS um, so that that process of, of review um, is very, very quick and um, you can quickly identify content that needs to be included in your course. So then, of course, students engage with this resource um, they do that with very seamlessly without any sort of um, logins or sign-on requirements. 
um, that happens within their known instructional environment, so they're not leaving the instructional environment, but they also understand the importance of these resources for their learning. And then finally, just the resounding need for analytics to really understand what students are doing, their time on task, their learning gaps, and use of resources. And these analytics provide insight to how students are actually using the content of the course and thus supporting their learning. So with that, um, I guess you can progress for me. I'm going to go through a few slides pretty quickly. And based on the description of those five components, I'd like to quickly walk through our faculty experience. And our platform is set up to allow faculty members to enter in some information about their course. Now, I say faculty members, but it's also instructional designers. We support both types of workflows um, in setting up the key components of, um, of the course. So in this case, um, the, the faculty member ID could um, provide a little bit of information about their course. Um, this would be if you're teaching a course and perhaps want to supplement or augment um, an existing textbook or even identify content that replaces it. But the point here is really that um, the faculty or ID is, is identifying some of the core topics that are associated with um, the course. Um, and it's, in this case, in a structure of the textbook, but doesn't necessarily have to be, it could be in a unit or a lesson. And then once the information is entered into the system, essentially you, you receive results based on specific topics. Um, so in the topics of demand and supply in the context of a macroeconomics course, I'm presented with results. And these results span across YouTube, Merlot, OER Commons, OpenStax, a number of sources that we have already indexed, um, a couple of dozen to date and growing. So the important thing here is that everything is under um, kind of one roof and one place to review content from multitude of sources that the content is organized based on topics and you can use more granular subtopics that you can then sort by publication date or the type of content or even if you're just interested in what, um, what is coming from OER Commons or what's only coming from Merlot, you can dig into those sources as well. And then once you identify an asset that you're interested in viewing, the faculty member is essentially able to view it right here in line. Um, they they um, can play this YouTube video right here, they can see the metadata, they can rate it or they can favorite it and ultimately add it to their course. Once they add, once they add the content to their course, they're able to provide some information to the students about why this resource is particularly important to student learning. So going to this next screen, which is actually what students see, students are seeing this entire asset, not just that there's a video here with a title, um, but also that there are learning objectives associated with this resource, that there is some pre-instruction, so they're told what they need to do and why this resource is important to them, as well as some, um, some next steps or, or the post-instructions, which provide students the next path um, towards their learning, gives them the sense that they need to do something important with this information. So from there, we're tracking the student engagement with that resource, their time on task, um, and then also pairing that with the context of why that resource is important. You can start to get a sense of understanding um, not only student behavior within your class, but also the value of some of the resources. Um, so we use the data in a couple of contexts. One is for course improvement, so evaluating courses after they've been taught and determining um, you know, hey, do we have the right resources in this course for our students? And then secondly, looking at the actual um, the student behavior during the class so that you could intervene. So I'll go through a couple of panels here just talking about the data that we have. So looking at um, student engagement based on the type of content, so what are the most popular types of content to students? What are they using the most? And, um, you know, this, this really provides a way for you to understand, you know, your student demographic better, what they're actually doing and what they're consuming. And perhaps it also helps you tweak the um, content mix or the source mix. In this case, also is understanding the sources um, to really fine tune and make sure that students are using um, and, and uh, consuming the content in a way that's supporting their learning um, and, and be able to make those decisions easily.
skipped one, sorry about that. Um, and then looking at specific resources. So what are the most popular, what are the least popular resources? Sometimes it has to go, that goes to um, from a least popular, like do students have access, is it an embedded resource, is it not promoted well? If it's a really critical resource, this can go to, um, and not being used, it, it can go to some course redesign efforts as well as understanding what those most popular resources are. What are students using consistently? What are they going back to? And how much time they're spending with those resources? And then from a perspective of search, um, we support the idea of student search. So Students are essentially, when they're searching, they're, they're identifying something that they're struggling with, that they have a question about, that they're curious about. And um, being able to capture their search terms and then understand um, what students did next, what assets were returned to them, um, really helps to identify most um, commonly if there's any gaps in your courses, as well as you know when you are returning um, information to students when they have a question, are you giving them the right information so that they can proceed? Um, and so using this information to really um, strengthen your course um, based on their engagement and activity. And then as I mentioned, as a final, you know, as a, a different type of important step is while the course is going on, um, how are students engaging with resources in real time? Um, what does that engagement time on task look like and that activity level based on the, um, the resources that they're using as well as the assessments that they have in their course, which is their progress based on learning objectives. Just having a high level snapshot as a class and then being able to dig into a particular student and understand, hey, why does CJ have um, a really high time on task but, and she has a lot of activity but she has low performance on objectives and her trends are low on performance. Um, being able to answer those questions and really understand what are students doing, are they doing the right things with the right resources that are um, um, able to get them towards success. So this information again provides a lot of insight into um, how students are using resources and then can go towards um, student interventions as well as course improvement. And again, with the focus on affordability, ensuring that students have the resources that they need on day one, that they're engaging with resources effectively, and that those resources are supporting their learning. So with that, I'm going to hand this back over to Megan for our discussion. Great. Callie and Tanya, if you want to take over and run us through the questions. Fantastic. The, uh, the first question we have was addressed to Matthew. They were wondering how many staff you have in your CTL. Uh, we have about 24 full-time staff. Great. Um, let's see, the next question is, says, this is not a diversity mixing on-site and online faculty with small budgets for such things. What advice would Matt have for smaller institutional models? I'm sorry, I don't know if that was true for everyone else, but the question was really broken up for me. Could you repeat that? You bet. My apologies. Uh, basically, they were asking, what advice do you have for smaller institutional models when it relates to um, smaller budgets for such things as implementing OER? Well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is uh, basically finding partners. Uh, we had looked at a few other um, nonprofit organizations who were willing to work with us. What we had found was the results weren't in the timeliness that we needed, but uh, that was a drawback of it. But there are, there are organizations out there who can help. 
with with no uh, no payment involved either. Uh, the other thing is to look internally, and I, I think this was brought up earlier about looking to your instructional designers for the sources that they know, and perhaps even start aggregating them in a library, a resources library that you could, you could share as a team. We started doing that as well as another one of our pilots. Uh, so those are a few things you could try, um, but there's opportunities to just be kind of creative. Okay, the next question came from Don Carter, and I'm not sure uh, what, I'm going to guess based on the timestamp that this was directed at um, Intellis, and they're asking what kind of engagement do you do? Sure. Um, so this is Mark. Um, you know, our, our engagements um, really vary based upon the need. Um, you know, so we mentioned about the cohort. Um, that's one model we're actively putting together right now, um, a next cohort group who will work to build um, one or two or three courses uh, for their uh, institution. So you can call it a bit of a pilot, if you will, but it's really to say, you know, how do we efficiently, effectively curate quality content and measure the effectiveness? So that's something we're doing. We also are launching a number of, of live pro projects right now where um, uh, we're looking to roll out for um, particular courses or departments, so it really depends. Um, you know, the other thing that's worth noting that I, I mentioned earlier as well is that um, what we see a lot of is, is not just a desire for faculty to identify OER content, but broad content. There, there's a tremendous amount of quality publisher content uh, aligned well with academic goals, so what a lot of people say to us is, help me find all of the content. It give me the tools to then um, use facets or filters to say, you know, I want to find a particular OER vid video for this concept, or I want to find some uh, publisher content from the repositories that I have uh, for this concept. So all those models are supported, and it, it's really based upon what the need uh, is for an individual institution. We're there as a technology facilitator and partner. Great, Kelly. Go ahead and ask the next question. I don't know that Tanya has been able to log back on yet. All right. The next question comes from Deborah, and she asks, how are OER and platforms like Intellis being used to facilitate inter-university collaborations around certificate programs, particular, particularly international collaborations? Natalie, I don't, I don't know if you, you want to take that. Um, you know, I, I, I can just say a few things that um, one of the things we envision holistically for our platform is this idea of, of collaboration, um, whether it's um, for a particular um, piece of, of OER content uh, to have faculty ratings and student ratings based upon their success uh, help inform uh, additional faculty selections. These are all things that we envision um, uh, down the road um, and, and already are building that base concept in. Um, but uh, I know Natalie thinks uh, a lot given that she's, she's from that world and, and, and understands well the importance of collaboration, having that as part of the roadmap. Natalie, I don't know if you managed to unmute. Can, can you want to add anything? No, that's exactly right, Mark. So the concept of content can, can come from a number of sources and can be shared amongst a group of institutions or um, amongst any institution that is part of um, or using the Intellis platform. So the, the um, platform enables that, in, and certainly state institutions that have content that's available um, to many institutions, that's something that we can um, we can do support. I think specifically for certificates programs and international marketplace, I, I look towards um, if Matt has anything, um, any examples from that, but certainly the, the use of the resources could be um, for anything that an institution would deem as, an, as, as important for um, their content. Great. It sounds like Fantastic. time for Natalie. 
Oh, this is Megan. I just want to jump in and invite Tanya to do her audio check and see if she is available to speak. Doesn't sound like we can hear you yet, Tanya. So we'll go ahead and move to Callie. Okay, we have one uh, last question in the question box. And it says, how do you ensure OER link content stability and currency? Are you employing link checking tools or other processes? Yes, um, that is something that we are uh, working to have more automated, but yes, that's, that is essentially what we're doing is checking um, the resources that have been curated for a course, so they have already been designated as part of the course, um, or across, um, across a, a, you know, the digital library, the, the OER index. So that is, um, that is definitely a question that we get a lot and something that we know is important is that re if resources disappear, then that's not helpful for students and they need to be replaced. Great. I, I realize we've gone over time, so I want to thank our presenters today. Mark Treese from Intellis Learning, Matthew Cooper at Thomas Edison State University, and Natalie Murray with Intellis Learning. And to our wonderful moderator today, Tanya, and I'm so sorry that we lost your audio. And thank you to my colleague, Kelly Morrison, who stepped in to help field and monitor the questions. Join us for our webcast next week on OER, where we'll bring together different consortium models and in how institutions can collaborate and expand OER innovations. We will be announcing our call for, call for proposals for the upcoming WCET annual meeting, save the date, October 12th through the 14th in Minneapolis, and stay tuned for more about the call for proposals. Our next event will be WCET's fifth leadership summit, which is on 21st century credentials in Salt Lake City. Registration is open for that event. Again, the webcast was recorded, and we will be sure to send a link to the archive and the resources next week. Thank you to WCET supporting members and finally our sponsors. So again, a round of applause for all of our presenters. Thank you for the attendance and the wonderful questions and engagement. We look forward to seeing you next week on our webcast. Thanks all.